in honor of our Declaration of Independence, today I have chosen to not follow the lectionary text. That's why we'll discover the bulletin has a different text on it than what we're using today. But I, I just really, truly felt that it was important that we look to God's Word at this particular time in our nation. And, and here's some radical truth about how God wants us to be living our lives as His representatives in our country. And I found these two texts that I think we're going to stay with, just these two today. The first one is from Proverbs, the book of wisdom. It says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. In Psalm 33, which we've heard today already, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. Some of you may remember, and some of you may not remember, about 13 years ago, last week or so, there was a, a two-to-one vote by a three-judge panel in the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals that ruled reciting the Pledge of Allegiance in public schools was unconstitutional. They ruled that the phrase one nation under God in the pledge was an endorsement of religion and thus violated what those two judges stated as the constitutional mandate of a wall of separation between church and state. And all of that was quoted. You can Google it, and you can see exactly that's what was stated. I just simply wrote their quotations down. Now, there are several things, folks, that you need to know today that are absolutely and historically false about those statements. And we're going to deal with that in just a minute. But I want to remind you how our nation responded to that ruling just 13 years ago. It was interesting, the reaction that took place. And I don't believe I've seen the vast majority of Americans ever so united as they were when it came against this judicial ruling. The first person that spoke out against this ruling was the President of the United States of America at that time, George Bush. And he said, that is ridiculous. That was his quotation. That is ridiculous. And not to be outdone by the president, the senators also called for a vote. And listen to me, whenever the Senate votes 99 to nothing against anything, we should take note of it. Amen? And then the House of Representatives jumped on the bandwagon too, and they voted unanimously to condemn the ruling as well. And as a result of all of that, Judge Alfred Goodwin, one of the two judges that initially ruled this, decided to order a stay on that ruling, which meant this, that the courts, until they decide differently, are going to go back to the way it was before the ruling. So he put a stay on their ruling. In other words, that ruling is not going to be implemented until the courts decide otherwise. And you know what? That is still true to this day. That ruling is still in a stay position where it is as it was before. We can recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, one nation, under God, in schools, in public places, anywhere you want to, and it's not unconstitutional. You see, all this uproar started because of a man that lived in California who happened to be an atheist, claimed that his daughter was offended when she went to school every day and had to hear all of her classmates say God in her presence. Well, as they began their investigation, they discovered that that wasn't true either. <laughs> as a matter of fact, the little girl's mother said, and I quote, we go to church regularly together, and she joins in with all of the students saying, one nation under God, when reciting the Pledge of Allegiance, and it doesn't bother her at all. That's the truth. Kind of reminds me of the story of what happened Back in the Bible, you remember the story about Joseph, don't you? That had the coat of many colors and how his brothers beat him and left him to, to be bought by slave traders. And then Joseph ended up in a power, in a place of prominence. And 
and God's children in their land were suffering from a great famine many years later, and, and Joseph's brothers uh, found themselves destitute and, and starving and hungry. Their dad had died, and they had to go to Joseph, who was in charge of rationing out food and water. And they says they begged for his forgiveness. In the Bible, in Genesis, the 50th chapter, it says they came and threw themselves down before Joseph and said, we are your slaves. But do you remember what Joseph's response to them was? He said, listen, don't be afraid of me. Am I in the place of God? He went on to say, you intended to harm me. But instead, God took what you intended to be bad and made something great happen as a result. In other words, you intended for evil, but God used it for good. And I believe that's exactly what happened in this ruling 13 years ago. Something that was intended to be evil, that was against God, God turned it all around and made something good happen as a result of that. For example, when, when that ruling was made known, on the television, I don't know if you remember this or not, but I do. I remember that the, the senators in the House of Representatives were all rushing the next day to get to the Capitol building because they wanted to be there to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag and say one nation under God in front of all the media so all the voting constituencies in America could see that they stood for that. As a matter of fact, instead of the usual empty chambers early in the morning when the chaplain was called in to pray for our nation and pray for our nation's leaders, there wasn't an empty seat. All the representatives, all the senators were there for prayer that day. That was 13 years ago. And I shared that with you to help us get a little contrast going here as to where we're at today how far we have fallen. You see, a simple act of the Pledge of Allegiance being unconstitutional because it contained the words under God raised such a furor in the media that it didn't take long for the courts to actually reverse their ruling. But a lot has changed today, hasn't it? Man, I can show you ruling after ruling after ruling just in the last couple of years that the media had it been the way it was 13 years ago, would have been an uproar. For example, two years ago in the state of Texas, the Texas legislature was ruling or deciding whether or not to limit late-term abortion in their state. And outside of their state building, the people were out there rallying. The pro-life people were out there with their banners, and the pro-abortion people were out there with their banners. And the pro-life people were singing Amazing Grace. And do you know what the pro-abortion people were doing to drown out the singing of Amazing Grace? They were shouting, Hail Satan! Hail Satan! Hail Satan! And one of the pro-abortion people actually shouted out, Mary should have had an abortion! She should have aborted Jesus. She was an illegitimate mother. Now, I'm here to tell you, you didn't hear that, did you? The media didn't choose to put that on the airwaves, did they? And you know why that is? I think it's because the media today, whenever it has anything to do with Christians or Christianity and our values being attacked, they throw it under the rug. It's obvious to me, brothers and sisters in Christ, that we have come a long way from the faith and the heritage of our founding fathers. We have come a long way from the ones who proclaimed in the Declaration of Independence that our rights actually come from where? They come from God. In the Declaration of Independence, it says that men are endowed by who? Their Creator. And our Creator is the one who endows us with our unalienable rights. The rights of life. Liberty and the pursuit of happiness are God-given rights. You see, in a sense, the very basic framework of our country, that our country grew out of this concept that God-given rights are what we have. But listen, when you begin to take God out, which is what's going on in our land today, you know what we're left with? It's on the screen. Read it. 
We're left with the nation whose freedom stemmed from nothing more than the whims of those who are in power. And that was a concept that the framers of our constitutional absolutely rejected. That was one of the reasons why they wrote the Constitution, was to make sure that we would stay on that foundation on the morals of God and the foundation of His word of truth. In the early 1960s, the U.S. Supreme Court removed prayer from, and the Bible from our public schools. We all were aware that that happened, right? And that's still true to this day. The book that used to be the number one textbook in America was overruled and tossed out of our school systems. 1966, I don't know if you remember, Time Magazine had on the front page of the Time Magazine, they declared that God was dead in America. Back in 1966. And that was just the beginning. I found this quote, and I think it's very interesting. Look at what it says. In a nation where the vast majority of citizens profess their belief in God, our courts have ruled that there is no place for His word, His praise, or His glory in any public place from the schoolroom to the city park. How can that be? How can that be? You know, a few minutes ago, I wanted to share with you, I said I'd share with you something about this wall of separation that these judges formed their mandate about taking one nation under God out of the Pledge of Allegiance, that they claimed it was the constitutional demanding wall of separation between church and state. And you know what? That is absolutely not true either. You will not find that wall of separation anywhere in the Constitution of the United States of America. And if you don't believe me, go read the Constitution and look for yourself. I did. And I found three of the highest judges in our land that stated the exact same truth. Look at what Judge Gallagher from New York wrote. Much has been written in these recent years about a wall of separation between church and state. This statement has received so much attention that one would almost think at times that it is, it is to be found somewhere in our Constitution. But folks, it isn't. Those words aren't anywhere in our Constitution. Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart wrote this. I think that the, the court's task is not responsibly aided by the uncritical invocation of metaphors like the wall of separation a phrase nowhere to be found in the Constitution. And when Chief, he was Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, uh, William Rehnquist wrote this, but the greatest inju injury of the wall notion is its mischievous diversion of judges from the actual intentions of the drafters of the Bill of Rights. The wall of separation between church and state is a metaphor based on bad history a metaphor which has proved useless as a guide to judging. It should be frankly and explicitly abandoned. So folks, the next time you hear somebody say something about this wall of separation between church and state being in our Constitution, you just need to know this. They're just parroting a metaphor that they have heard, and it's not true. No more is it true that our kids cannot say the Pledge of Allegiance and say one nation under God in any schoolroom across this land. And anybody who says they can't is going against what the Constitution, against what the judges actually rule. And you know, I for one thought that our kids couldn't say it anymore. How many of you felt the same way? How many of you thought that there is an actual wall of separation between church and state in America but mandated in the Constitution? And it is not. That is an absolute lie. But that's what they want us to think. So that we'll keep God out of school. So that we'll keep the, the Ten Commandments off our, 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 part, our, our parts and, and our, our capital buildings. It's not true. It's a bold-faced lie. The same kind of propaganda is being used here that was used by Adolf Hitler's Ministry of Propaganda. And look at what he said. He said, if you tell a lie long enough and loud enough and often enough, 
You can make people believe about anything. And that's exactly what's going on in America today. I just wanted to share with you some truth. So I think you get my point. Just because the media says it doesn't mean it's true, the brothers and sisters. Make sure you know what the truth is and discover it if you have questions, if you have doubt. So let's get back to the text because our nation was founded on the Word of God. And that, my friends, is truth. And you can go to the archives of all the writings that are in the White House and in, and in our places of history, in the Smithsonian, and all of those places and find the original writings of our founding fathers. And they always, always, always place everything that they decided on top of the foundation of God's Word. Every single time. Without reservation. <clears throat> so we need to get on with God's Word. Because righteousness is what exalts a nation. And sin disgraces it. Amen? And blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people He chose for His inheritance. Now briefly, in the closing time that we have, we could go two directions with this. I could start off by listing all the things that are going wrong in our nation today and all the lies that are out there uh, and beyond what I've already shared with you. And I could just give you two examples uh, of lies that have been told to all of America. But instead of going that direction, I feel like it would be better for us to take a positive direction in this and see, in fact, that God did bless this nation and God is still blessing this nation. And I believe that there are some foundational reasons as to why that is happening. So why should God bless America? Well, I think God should bless America because America has been a good nation. And, and no, I'm not sitting here saying we should pat ourselves on the back, but listen, our nation has tried to do the right things from the founding fathers forward. Righteousness exalts a nation. And our founding fathers knew that. Our founding fathers also knew that sin would disgrace our nation. But first and foremost, I believe God has blessed America because we're a generous people. He has blessed us to be the land of plenty. And our people in America have always been very generous with what we have and helping those who are less fortunate. And you know, that's founded in God's Word because Jesus said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. In Romans, the Word of the Lord said, if your enemy's hungry, give him something to eat. And if he's thirsty, then get him a drink. And that's what we do in America. How many of you have ever heard of a man by the name of Gordon Sinclair? He's a Canadian television commentator. You heard of him? He had a, a, a commentary, an editorial that he put on public television back in 1973. And I know that that was a long time ago, but I think it's just as relevant now as it was then. I want to share with you some of what he said in his commentary about Americans being the most generous people in the world. And this was a man from Canada. And this entire address that he put together is now part of a congressional record documented and stored in Congress. And this is his quote. Let me share it with you. This Canadian thinks it's time to speak up for the Americans as the most generous and possibly the least appreciated people on all the earth. Germany, Japan, and to a lesser extent, Britain and Italy were lifted out of the debris of war by the Americans who poured in billions of dollars and forgave other billions of dollars in debts. None of these countries is today even paying interest on its remaining debt to the United States of America. When the franc was in danger of collapsing in 1956, it was the Americans who propped it up. And their reward was to be insulted and swindled on the streets of Paris. I know that for a fact because I was there and I saw it. He went on to quote saying, when distant cities are hit by earthquakes, it's the United States that hurries in to help. And this spring, there were 59 American communities flattened by tornadoes. Nobody helped America. The Marshall Plan, the Truman Policy, pumped billions
billions of dollars into discouraged countries, and now newspapers in those very countries are writing about the decad decadent, warmongering Americans. When the railways of France, Germany, and India were breaking down through age, it was the Americans who rebuilt them. But when the Pennsylvania Railroad and the New York Central went broke, nobody loaned them even an old caboose. I can name you at least 5,000 times when the Americans raced to the help of other people in trouble. Can you name me even one time when someone raced to help Americans when they were in trouble? Our American neighbors have faced it alone, and I'm one Canadian who is tired of hearing them get kicked around. They'll come out of this thing with their flag held high as they always do. And they will have the right to put their thumb up their nose and their troubles to their present people. But I hope Canada is not one of those countries. End quote. You see, I believe God has blessed America and continues to bless America because we are a generous nation. We are a very giving people. Now, I also believe that God is blessing America because right makes might. The terrorists that we're fighting today believe just the opposite. They believe might makes right. They believe that if they're willing to use a bomb even to their own death to try to throw fear into the heart of people to submit to their will and their ways. They believe that it is their might that makes right. But America believes just the opposite. We believe standing on what is right is what makes us mighty. It's just the opposite. Think of this small, struggling nation in the 1700s. We were a nation of primarily farmers. That's what we were. And I've discovered through the Truth Project that they were very well-educated farmers, by the way. Their language and the writings that we see some of our founding fathers that were just a bunch of farmers, very intelligent men and women. But we didn't have the industrial factories of Great Britain. Matter of fact, we depended upon them for our own supplies. We depended on Britain's army and navy for our protection. So when it came to the American Revolution, we had none of the ingredients except we had right on our side. And remember, right is what makes might. In our little log cabin schools, children all across America, learning reading, writing, and arithmetic, but most importantly, they were learning the foundation of God's holy word. Every student in class was being taught God's word. And reading, writing, and arithmetic were a byproduct of teaching them God's word. Because our founding fathers believed they were right, they waged war. And the 13 colonies had a few armaments and limited, very limited resources, facing the largest army and navy in the world at that time, the largest empire in history, the British Empire, and they defeated them. How did that happen? <laughs> because they were standing on the truth of God's word. As a result of that, our founding fathers produced the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States of America that gave the greatest amount of freedom to the greatest number of people. You see, the United States grew to give the greatest good to all mankind. Why did that happen? How did that happen? Because America made the choice to stand on what is right. And where does America discover what right is? It came from the Word of God. The foundation of the truth that God taught us. I mean, look at all the wars the United States has fought. Compare them to the wars of other nations. You know, most of the other empires only go to war to gain wealth and, and land and, and take over territories. But the United States doesn't do it that way. And I don't know about you, but it frustrates me all the time when I see us going in to try to capture or maybe rescue a country from depression and a country that's being oppressed by dictatorships and ruling authorities, and then we turn right around and go in there and rebuild their country for them after we have taken them over. And I say to myself, why are we spend all this money on all these other people when i got people right here in America starving to death? But that's what America does. 
We rebuild countries after we've had war in those countries to help build them back up, to have the same opportunity that we have here. The American experience of freedom and liberty has been tested in every century and every generation from George Washington to today. And it seems that there have always been challenges on the American freedom. And we are facing those challenges once again. And I am convinced that the only way, the only way we are going to win is to remember that right is what gives us our strength. Right makes might. And listen to me. It's not getting God on our side that's important. <laughs> we must be on God's side. <laughs> that's the only way we're going to win. That's the only way God will bless America. Is if we're on his side. You see, God has blessed America also because our country, Christian America, they believe in the Great Commission. The United States of America sends missionaries out into all the world to fulfill the Great Commission that Jesus Christ gave, going to all nations, making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them the ways of obedience from the very beginning. Our colonies, our settlers, they evangelized the Indians. Did they not? That's what they did. That's why they came here. If you read in the, the, the statements of our founding fathers, the reason they came here was to bring God to America. That was their purpose for being here. And they shared the good news of Jesus Christ with everybody they ran into. And since World War II, the, the United States Center for World Missions in Pasadena, California reports there have been over 600,000 career missionaries who have gone into almost every part of the world. Isn't that amazing? Since World War II, 600,000 of them. And what do these missionaries do? Well, obviously, they evangelize. They share the gospel. But in the process, Countless are the number of hospitals, orphanage, clinics, agricultural centers, schools, colleges, seminaries that have been built and are functioning today globally as a result of the effort of these missionaries. Praise God. We are a sending nation. And we are committed to living the Great Commission. That's why God's blessed America. Because we're a generous people that stand on the right of God and we believe in sharing it with the world. That is why God is blessing America. So here's the deal. If you're truly concerned about America, I mean, if you earnestly want God to bless her, if you want to be one nation under God, then it's time we get serious about being fully committed to God and living our lives in complete harmony with His good, pleasing, perfect will. Because that, my friends, is the way God will continue to bless America. Today, may we be one nation under God, and may God bless America once again. Let's stand together and sing both verses of our Star Spangled Banner. <coughs>